We're going to take a hard turn from, uh, from wearable devices and technology to uh, spend some time with one of the smartest investors out there uh, these days. It is a true pleasure and a rare opportunity to hear uh, from Paul Singer today uh, of Elliott uh, Management. Come on out here, Paul, if you could. How are you? It's, that music seems very, uh, you know, like you're coming into. I know you're an activist investor, but that I, that sounded like very kind of takeover uh, style music. Um, for those of you who don't know Paul, he 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 started Elliott Management. Uh, it has really been a, a remarkable ride, and he has said uh, and speaks uh, his mind uh, often in his letters, um, occasionally in person. And we're thrilled that you're you're here to do that. Uh, what I'm hoping, and, and he's been in the news for all sorts of reasons, and we could talk about some of those, um, but I just want to start with, with the economy and where we are, and I want to read you from your own letter, uh, which got a lot of press. And That's I not fair. <laughs> and I want to get you to expound on it. Uh, you, you recently wrote about, this is about the Federal Reserve and the economy, we do not think this optimism is warranted, and we think a lot of data is cooked or misleading. A good deal of the economic and jobs growth since the crisis has been fake growth and very little chance of being self-reinforcing and sustainable. We just had uh, what seemed like great jobs numbers last week, 321,000 new jobs uh, that were added. And everybody thought that was great news. The markets have been up. Is everybody wrong? Um, what you have to uh, uh, consider is what has happened since the financial crisis. And since the, um, uh, the 08 crisis, for the past six years, um, although we all know, or most of us know, what pro-growth policies would look like, what policies would look like that could generate sustained, sustainable, uh, self-regenerating uh, growth, policies in tax stability, uh, attractive tax regimes, regulatory regimes, understandable regulatory um, uh, uh, policies, um, trade, um, education. We, we know what structural reforms would look like to try to regenerate the kind of growth that, uh, that um, America and parenthetically the rest of the developed world uh, were used to uh, pre-dot-com pre boom, pre-financial uh, bubble, uh, the structured products and the debt bubble. Um, those policies have not been pursued in the United States, pro-growth policies in the United States and indeed in the rest of the developed world. In, instead, the entire job, literally the entire job, of supporting the global economy, at least in the developed world, has been ceded to the monetary authorities. So what's happened for the last six years is basically 0% interest rates everywhere in the developed world, plus this quantitative easing. So bond buying and the commensurate uh, impact levitating financial assets has really been the, the principal, uh, indeed the sole, uh, pro-growth mechanism uh, in the developed world. And so what's that, what that has created is a, is a uh, series of distortions. And um, uh, some of the distortions have created what I've described elsewhere in uh, that and uh, other of my uh, missives um, as a, uh, an unfair recovery, a distorted recovery, um, meaning the beneficiaries of the asset price levitation, bondholders, stockholders, investors, uh, people who own stuff that investors right. uh, 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 own, are doing great. The middle class is not doing great. So the job numbers, uh, as an example of one of the distortions, one of the, uh, the uh, misleading or fake uh, economic uh, figures, um, uh, the headline jobless rate, which today is 5.8%, has to be juxtaposed with a steady decline to about a 35-year low in the labor force participation rate. So people are, are leaving the economy, even people not in retirement age, uh, and are um, um, out of the statistics. So do we blame the Federal Reserve for, for inequality or the growing inequality in this country? That's a really, uh, really interesting question because, uh, and uh, Bill Dudley asked me the same question in a lunch I had down at the Federal Reserve about two years ago. 
And uh, my, answer is, my answer is yes. And the reason my answer is yes is the Federal Reserve Board could say to the fiscal authorities, um, same in the United States, the same in Japan, um, uh, Chairman Yellen could say, we've done enough. It's up to the President and Congress to generate the policies to unleash the growth potential that uh, this country, that country, uh, Europe, uh, are capable of. And so um, by, in effect, enabling politicians throughout the developed world to um, avoid taking what they obviously consider to be tough steps to unleash growth, perhaps it's ideological, perhaps it's just lack of strong leadership, but they are enablers, and I blame them for that. Okay, but turn it around. If the Federal Reserve didn't keep interest rates as low as they have been, where would we be? You know, that's a question that, that um, ignores the fact that what you need is normal interest rates together with pro-growth policies. Just a normalization of interest rates in today's fragile world, and I point to, uh, as an evidence of fragility, the, um, the taper tantrum uh, of, mm -hmm. uh, what was it, May, uh, May a year ago, mm -hmm. a year and a half ago. Um, um, and so even the hint that interest rates would lift off this, this tiny little sliver of rates, zero or a tiny bit, um, caused about 100 basis point or 80 to 100 basis point backup in medium and long-term rates. Um, and so the financial system is way more fragile than it was in the days uh, uh, when uh, Chairman Volcker could wring inflation by its little neck um, uh, uh, with 20% short-term interest rates without damaging or killing the economy. So um, I think it's a, it's, a, um, it's, a, it's a different world. And, um, and so therefore what? What should the Federal Reserve do? Given, given the box that they think they're in, whether, that the, whether they should be thinking about it like that or not, I do not know. What they can't do, literally can't do, is start to raise interest rates in a uh, determined and uh, sort of a, a, a steady and sharp way toward normal levels. Savers are obviously being cheated and driven out on the risk curve, all kinds of distortions. They can't do that. They can't do that by itself. But as I say, and I think it would be a uh, a, a catal possibly catalytic. It's a fantasy. It, it, it won't happen. The Fed loves its role as the, um, the uh, Samson holding up or Atlas holding up the world. Um, but what they should do is say to the fiscal authorities, to the president, we've done enough. Interest rates have been zero for uh, six years. And what we have, even with the data that you described um, mostly accurately as good data, the most recent data, um, uh, uh, we've had, you know, the last uh, 12 months, year over year, is about 2% on their numbers. And their numbers are kind of wrong because they've understated inflation, as I've said other places given, in my reports. Given your view, what is your sense of where the markets are right now? Well, uh, let's talk about the bond market and the stock market separately. They're linked, obviously, but um, um, one, one always looks for... Um, extremes in markets. I'm a trader. I'm a risk manager. Uh, I've managed my fund for 38 years and try not to lose money um, regardless of the economic uh, circumstances. So uh, the extreme today in valuation is uh, bonds, global high quality bonds, um, the US bonds, European bonds. And I think the 30 year bond, the 10 year bond, medium and longer term bonds are uh, uh, provide horrendous value, and the reason, the reason they do is not just the possibility or the risk of future inflation, but because of um, how they got there. Um, there's, um, there's a very, very old Wall Street joke, which I will uh, 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 tell in a very truncated fashion. Um, in the 1920s, a broker and a client, and the broker comes up with a stock. The uh, client starts buying, he buys, it goes up, says this broker's a genius, he keeps buying every day, every couple of days, it's going up, it's going up, it's going up. Um, after about two weeks, it's up 300%. The client goes to the broker and says, um, let's sell. And the broker says, of course, to who? Um, so um, um, 
The price of bonds, and because of the capital market line, the risk uh, uh, equivalent uh, uh, capital market line, um, the price of stocks also, the price of bonds has been uh, influenced by the one big buyer, and that is central bank, this central bank, central banks around the world. Uh, nobody knows what the price of bonds would be in the absence of the central bank buying. So bonds are overpriced. Uh, it does not mean that bonds are about to, and I would never make a market call, um, uh, collapse. But um, they're very, very overpriced with a risk reward. Let's put it this way. Uh, if there are any institutional managers, money managers in the room, you cannot meet your actuarial assumptions owning uh, the 30-year uh, euro swap at one point. 5-8% uh, or wherever it is today. Um, uh, stocks are a more complicated picture because uh, equities have been influenced by central bank buying uh, and by the, you know, what I think of as artificial resuscitation of the economy versus sustainable. But in the event that investors uh, uh, lose confidence, right. lose confidence in governments, lose confidence in paper money, one of the ways that they could lose confidence is by bidding up not only possibly gold and commodities, things, uh, real estate, um, but stocks. So it's very hard to know how stocks would react in an environment uh, in which confidence is lost. I just want to point out that there's a theory which is practiced by some number of hundreds of billions of dollars of an institutional uh, money of risk parity, where um, uh, the bonds hedge stocks, and you can own, you can equivalent your risk in stocks and bonds by a certain leveraged position in bonds uh, versus stocks. Um, the risk parity folks have been doing fantastically because both stocks and bonds have gone up, uh, and it wouldn't be out of the question if, in the next period of market adversity, which I am not predicting, uh, uh, it would be a fool's right. errand to do so. Um, both stocks and bonds uh, go down simultaneously. So uh, that was a long-winded way of saying versus vis-a-vis -vis stocks, I don't know. Uh, let me ask you about something I know you know a lot about, which is Argentina. Um, you have been in a long-running uh, battle, if you will, with the country that is Argentina. You won a Supreme Court uh, decision over the summer, and Argentina chose to default uh, rather than pay you and your, your bondholders. Um, there's a clause coming up uh, in these exchange bonds that Argentina, uh, Argentina officials cite is the obstacle to negotiating. That clause, I believe, expires next month. This month. Uh, the January, end of this month. The end of this month, so January. Are we going to see direct talks? What is going to happen? How do you see this playing itself out? Well, we have said for quite a while that, um, from, uh, that this is, up to now, a lose-lose situation. Um, uh, we bought performing debt of Argentina. Um, we, along with um, th tens of thousands of other bondholders, um, did not go for the worst uh, sovereign restructuring offer, which was actually a take it or leave it offer, um, uh, ever made to a, a, a significant country. Argentina was the seventh largest economy in the world coming out of uh, World War II. So what, what has happened over the course of more than 13 years is that Argentina through, uh, has been in default on uh, what now is billions of dollars of uh, 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 debt that did not participate in their two exchanges, one in 2005, one in 2010. Um, uh, but they never negotiated with the holdouts. And so uh, what, they, what they have experienced in that period of time is interest rates and credit spreads far wider um, uh, by billions of dollars per year, a falling currency, much more inflation than they would have otherwise by being in default and by lacking access to international credit markets. So one would think if the Rufo clause was indeed the, um, the barrier to a um, negotiation between the holdouts in Argentina, one would think that there would be a uh, a, um, a uh, reasonable, be, uh, we have said, and I believe, that it would be very easy to settle this thing. And we have, we have expressed, and other uh, bondholders have expressed, the willingness to negotiate, the willingness to take um, But do you paper. think they will? Um, 
You know, I think that given the, um, given the fact that our, the government of Argentina has elevated a commercial, a purely commercial dispute um, uh, in which we basically have said, we're not willing to take your offer, but they've put no counter offer. They've elevated that commercial dispute uh, uh, into a dispute in which they posture it, position it as a dispute about national dignity. Uh, given that, it's very uh, difficult, it's impossible to predict what they actually will do uh, on, January, on or after January 1. It makes every uh, degree of sense in the world for them to sit down with us and work out us and the other uh, bondholders and make a deal. Let me ask you a completely different question, because um, I saw some comments that you made uh, about a month and a half ago. I don't know if uh, uh, everyone in the audience saw, but CalPERS announced uh, that they were getting out of the hedge fund business. They did not want to invest in hedge funds anymore. Um, they cited the fees, they cited transparency, they cited a lot of things. And other pension funds around the country, I think, have taken note of that, and some say that they're going to uh, sort of look at that. What do, you, what do you think of what CalPERS has done? I have said, and I believe, that um, I think they've made a mistake. Um, uh, I'm not going to uh, think or exactly say that it's the effective equivalent of those old Business Week covers that said the death of equities on the week that equities began a 20-year run uh, uh, up, uh, the sort of, you know, the sort of magazine. You're not going to say that. I'm not going to say that at all, um, but I uh, hinted at it. Um, but, but I will say that it's peculiar, um, uh, given, the, um, given the distortions in the stock and bond markets, which are undeniable, the, this $4 trillion of bond buying uh, 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 having affected the, the prices of the bonds that Calper owns, uh, CalPERS owns, uh, the, um, uh, the equities. Um, I would think, and I do think, that, um, that um, institutional investors like CalPERS um, um, need to diversify their, the, um, the, uh, the, in the investment styles that they have in their portfolio. Um, hedge funds or some hedge funds, and I, I feel uncomfortable being a spokesperson or a speaking for an industry. It's not really an industry. Uh, the hedge fund asset class covers a tremendous amount of territory in terms of strategies and risk, risk and reward. But, um, but um, it needs to be said that there are a bunch of people like us uh, and others that um, are actually doing something different uh, 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 with our money, uh, applying some degree of attempted finesse, uh, trying to make money as we do. Uh, you know, our, our investment style is trying to create uh, uh, risk protection and value creation by uh, manual effort. So activism, um, uh, bankruptcy investing, get on the committee, try to do something. Um, there are a lot of people out there that have generated consistent returns with relatively low risk for a long period of time. CalPERS is not too big to have a group of, uh, of trading firms or uh, hedge funds in their mix. That they, have, that they have chosen to desert this asset class now um, could, you know, it would be sort of funny in a sort of a, a peculiar way if this was actually a period of overperformance. Um, uh, we, since the top of equities in um, uh, the year 2000, um, have made uh, more than a couple of hundred percent return. Equities have made basically nothing. So, it depends on where you choose your starting right. and ending points. But I think they're wrong in deserting that asset class just because of complexity and the perception that fees are higher. Let me ask you a question about the asset class, if you will. You are put into a bucket now increasingly called activism. Uh, I did an interview uh, earlier this year with Marty Lipton, uh, the famed lawyer from Wachtell Lipton. Uh, we talked a lot about activists. As you might imagine, he doesn't like a lot of activists. Uh, he even named you as one of those that he does not like. He thinks that activists are short-termers. They are not long-termers. They're forcing companies to make uh, bad decisions under enormous amounts of pressure. You say what to Marty Lipton? <laughs> um, I, I'm not sure that I've ever met him, um, but, um, but here's what I would uh, say to uh, Marty. Um, corporate governance in America uh, is... Um, 
uh, is, has over a long period of time become, uh, become something that contains significant degrees, not in every corporation or even in most corporations, of stultification, um, uh, self, you know, self-perpetuation. Um, let me give you a couple of examples of what I, what I mean by that, underperformance, undermanagement, or mismanagement. Um, we run into companies in our analysis um, in industries in which none of the board members or almost none of the board members know anything about that industry, other companies in which um, um, uh, management uh, insiders own no stock or almost no stock, um, and um, it, it's not the case, basically, in corporate America that the model is actually followed. The model is the shareholders um, elect the board, and the board selects management. The board creates strategy, and the board um, uh, oversees management. It's basically, in a lot of areas in corporate America, the opposite. That is to say, the management basically not exactly selects the board, although in some cases it is, it is that. But, um, but I, think, I think Marty is, is, is wrong in saying that, in general, the activists have nothing to bring to the table. We analyze companies, other activists, I can't speak for any other activists except ourselves, um, see where we think that there's a, uh, there's, Value to be uh, value to be generated. I just want to make one more point about that. Um, Marty Lipton actually has an axe to grind. He has been advising companies, good companies, bad companies, entrenched managements, managements that deserve to be uh, defended, f for uh, dozens of years. And so, it's it's not exactly protection money, uh, <laughs> but uh, it's you know he's constructing a moral case. Uh, around uh, entrenching management. And I don't think every activist is right, and I don't think every management is wrong. But I think there's, um, and one more point I want to make is that we've done an analysis of this point that they make over and over again, short-termism. Our holding period for equities and activist equities um, uh, is l uh, a longer holding period than the average institutional holding period of equities. So um, it's, just not, it's just not accurate. Let me ask you about new, uh, these new approaches that activists are taking. Bill Ackman uh, did a deal earlier this year where he teamed up with Valiant in advance of a transaction. Do you see that as a trend? Do you, see, do you ever think to yourself, I could become a partner of another company and do that? There were questions about, there were moral questions about that. There were questions about, uh, whether activists and corporations are going to start working together. There was questions about whether uh, you were effectively knew too much information. In what do you think of that kind of stuff? I mean, are, are we moving into a whole new arena? I don't think we're moving into a whole new arena. I think, uh, Bill, on the face of it, I, I'm not um, an expert on what, exactly what he did and the implications of it. We've, we've not done anything like that um, and are not considering uh, anything like that, but I think it was crea at least creative. I don't know if it was, if it was, um, if it was um, a good or a bad uh, strategy. But uh, um, no, I, I think that activism will be uh, governed uh, over a period of time, uh, assuming people uh, meet their legal and regulatory obligations, governed by results. The results um, will be clear in each case and in a number of cases. And I think there are, surprisingly, and we found in our activities, surprisingly in companies that are not just small companies and uh, uh, medium companies, but large companies, opportunities for real changes, real improvements. Um, it's, not just, it's not just being hostile. You know, we try to work with companies first and, and uh, test our assumptions and have discussions and uh, see uh, if, our, if our theses are right about companies and the kinds of improvements uh, that can be made by changes in strategy, right. changes in, uh, in corporate structure. I see that we're out of time and I'm getting the wrap, but I want to say thank you because we could talk about this stuff all afternoon. It's been a fantastic conversation. Thank sure, you, Paul. thank you. Appreciate it very, very much. Thank you.